Explore One today. It's Thursday, May 25th, 2023. And this is the week in charge. I'm sure I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what we can talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a plethora to say about that, or a lot to say about that. I use the word plethora because one of you guys said, whenever I use that word, it means a lot. Your questions are on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. Just put in your symbols. Uh, wait for the live charts if you don't mind for your benefit. Put in your symbols one at a time and then hit enter so I can look at each individual one. We'll do crypto first as we normally do. So what are we going to focus on? Well, I want to continue to follow up on a crypto trade. And we have a new crypto trade tonight. I'll show you in a few minutes. And we'll see what happens. And also we have a core methodology. Finally, we have a, a winner. Knock on wood, come in, uh, in the portfolio. As far as mailbag, I want to continue my discussion on yes, uh, last week's, I should say, question on system design. Last week, what I did, what I focused on mostly was my thoughts and random thoughts on system design. And then this week, I hate when somebody gets asked a question and doesn't answer the question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the question mm -hmm. and answer each item one by one. Now there's gonna be a lot of overlap from last week as I noticed when I was putting together this presentation. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff now between now and then. All right, let's talk about using the core methodology in crypto. And then I wanna focus on free rolling, which is the secret to longer term trading success, as you know. Several weeks ago, I mentioned this one in this presentation as a pullback and entry was there and I was able to bang out the IPT. And then I wrote the next big thing. And so far I've been just hanging on and what's kind of cool, and I know you want to party with me, but what's kind of fun about having the educational business is I can make it a game and it's a lot of fun to just try to hang on as long as I can. If I wasn't showing you these trades and talking about these trades and putting out a trading service daily, not for crypto, but for stocks, and telling you exactly when to do, what to do, when to do it, how to do it, then it would probably be harder for me to follow my own plan. But if I say buy a thousand shares of this stock per 100K or whatever the case may be, I'll show you one in a second. Then I too am going to buy a thousand shares, and then that way we're both in the same ride together. And then it forces me, from a selfish standpoint, to follow my own plan. And that way you can see, oh, well, all he did was follow his plan. And I make it look a lot easier than it is when we get when we finally catch those elusive big winners. And yeah, I did say the word elusive because they don't come along every day. But quoting my wife, all you got to do is like whatever. There's something to be done around the house. It's always minor and she says all you got to do and it turns into a much bigger deal but carrying that thinking over to trading all you got to do is just hang on and have a stop in place to take you out of these longer term trends and as it moves more and more in your favor then you can trail a stop higher so again free rolling is really the secret to longer term success we're taking a short term profit off we're getting that stop to break even when the initial profit target is hit, and then we're going to trail it more loosely on the remainder. And I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully be with the position for a long, long time. So here's SYM. You can see it was a Landry Light pullback. Notice the Landry Light down below, as I say each week. And the reason I say it each week is because somebody's going to ask me if I don't. But this little in indicator down here, or as I call it, the illustrator, counts the number of bars that the lows are greater than the moving average or for the downside the highs are less than the moving average simple little concept i discovered in 1995 or 1994 i wrote about it in 95 i think it got published in 1996 good stocks and commodities and back then i just i forget what i called it but somebody who read the article called it daylight and then it became Dave Light, and then now it's Landry Light, in case you're wondering on that. Anyway, so notice that the Landry Light was at fairly high numbers, about 30 or so, 30-something, 
and then it goes back to zero. Well, when it intersects the moving average, the count goes back to zero. This is a great little setup, and, and that's the question is, how do you discover these things? Well, you just start looking at a lot of charts, and I discovered the Landry-like pullbacks by looking at the 20 EMA and looking at longer-term trends and looking for pullbacks to the moving average. And by accident, I was like, okay, well, the Landry light is a pretty good judge of trend. How am I going to quantify or qualify the pullbacks? Like, well, what if it just pulls back to the moving average? So you don't want to trade that necessarily 100% mechanically, but it does give you a head start, especially if you're a new -er to trading, to find a fairly easy to recognize, fairly easy to scan for, too, a uh, program that scans for something like this type of setup. So again, this is a Landry-like pullback. Now, one thing that's kind of cool with this setup, I don't know you want part of me, but notice that we were in a somewhat gradual, longer-term uptrend, and then we begin to accelerate higher. That's what I call the accelerating momentum strategy. And notice that the trend higher was a nice persistent one, meaning that it tended to go up bar after bar after bar. And you could draw a line through as many bars as possible. Mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. I just like to draw a line through as many bars as I can intersect. Entry was here, stop was down here. I'll show you the spreadsheet in a second. Initial profit, initial profit target was up here. When that IPT is hit, you bring your stop at the break even. We do trail it a little bit before that initial profit target is hit it, as the position moves in our favor, or if the position moves in our favor, I should say. So I took profits a little early. I felt like it had, it had this pop higher over two days, and then it looked like it was kind of running out of gas a little bit. And my position size was a little bit larger in my accounts than what I had uh, shown in the trading service. I think I rounded up a little bit. So money-wise, I had what I was looking for, but price-wise, I was just a little shy, and I went ahead and locked and loaded. I mean, a little shy, but uh, based on the the stop distance, it was it was fairly close. So let's say you use it a one point stop. Well, if you're if you got if you have 50 cent profit, then you're not that close. Okay, but this was a, a much wider stop, which you'll see in one second. And that was I felt like it was close enough. So the stop was what was the original stop on this? 5.4 points. Okay, so you were up close to five points on it. Eh, close enough for government work as far as the way I was looking at it with this particular setup. And also, one thing I often preach about, and it's something you really have to be careful to separate from your, your trading, is what extraneous influences are influencing your trade. The fact that I haven't had a lot of winners lately, the fact that I could use a little money, the fact that I need a little money, and all these other things kind of came into focus. And it's like, you know what, this might be a gift horse. Obviously, I didn't know it was going to keep on going, so I decided to go ahead and lock and load. All right, let's jump back in the mailbag, and we're going to continue with Hal's question from last week. And I'm going to – let me address the bottom of this, and then I want to show you something that came up with me talking about the TFM 10% system in the queues, and then we'll we'll go line by line in his question. Now, he said, for a long time, you've been talking about your intraday experimentation and mentioned you will show us what you're doing eventually. Yeah, if I can bottle something up, to where I could show you and you could take the ball and run with it. But it's it hasn't really morphed into anything just yet. In recent weeks, you announced many times discussing zero DTE options. I'm not sure if zero DTE options are part of your previously mentioned intraday experimentation, although it certainly needs to happen intraday, or if this is something that caught your eye and you decided to start a new experiment. Yeah, it's something that caught my eye. I decided to start a new experiment. It also, it just, I haven't really fleshed anything out. Initially, I did really well with these things and I got all excited. And you know how it goes. You, Whenever you try something new, a lot of times, and it's probably the worst thing that happened, is you do exceptionally well. And then you go back to grinding it out a little bit. And then you, you kind of end up kind of um, trying to chase that chase that high that you got initially or whatever. I'm trying to think of a better way of looking at it, but you're trying to chase that previous performance. And that's sort of where I am now. One thing that I've done that I think is a little bit on the dangerous side, I always preach keep it at simple, but lately I've been doing a little ratio spreads where you get short the inside 
and long the outside, one strike out. And if I could do that for a scratch, ideally, especially in the mornings when the options are super expensive. So, and that gives me a little decay during the day on those options. And that's something that I really didn't want to get into. And I found myself kind of getting sucked into it. So rather you go along this journey with me and then make mistakes with me, let me just see what I could get out of it and then figure out a simple way for us all to use it. But yeah, I do, I will sell uh, things. No, I'm actually buying the ratio spreads, Jeff. I, I'm not a big fan of being short options and, you know, two drink minimum, so stories there, but it ended really, really badly. So what I will do is I'll, I'll short the inside and go long the outside. And yeah, it would Jeff saying that morning uh, high price better for selling. Yeah, in the mornings it's like, but sometimes I want to get long puts or I want to get long calls. And then I'll put on that ratio spread, especially if I could get it close to a debit. And then I find those options, the short options tend to decay throughout the day. And if the market goes crazy, then you th then your outside options pay off. And what I also do, without getting into all the details, again, I tell you I was going to figure it out first and then tell you about it. But what I also do is I will put in an order. Let's say, like today, I sold uh, some puts for a buck and then I bought the outside. Well, what I'll do is I'll put in an order for like 10 cents to buy back those puts just to cover the puts or cover the calls, whatever the case may be, if I'm short the calls. I don't like being short options at all. And even though with the ratio spread, I'm doing two to one. So the outside is covered. My max loss is a point. And I think it might be a viable strategy, but you got to be super careful that you don't end up with too many moving parts. And then it's like, okay, well, once you get one side on, then it's like, well, technically I could put the other side on because the short put is going to offset the short call and vice versa. And then now all of a sudden it's starting to get pretty complicated. So got to be really, really, really careful. But um, Jeff, maybe you and I could talk a little bit offline and I could pick your brain a little bit. Sounds like you really know uh, know the options. So it'd be kind of kind of fun to uh, talk about that. I know you want to party with me. <laughs> Now, before we get into Hal's questions on system design, following up on that, somebody wrote a comment on, I think it was the stock charts channel or possibly uh, my channel. They said that the QQQ COVID TFM sell signal was as bad as it gets. Why use it now for a buy signal? Well, let's take a look at that. So here was your... COVID, so to speak, pandemic sell signal in the queues, and the market dropped 20% from that signal. So you got to ask yourself, as I'm going to kind of reiter reiterate a lot tonight, is is that a bad signal or designer's intent? Well, the, the design of the system was, of course, to, to get you in markets when they go up, but the main initial designer's intent was to get you out of markets and keep you out of trouble. And knock on wood, so far, this has done really, really well, especially in the S&P 500 going all the way back to the 1900s. And that's what I did all the testing on. And it's just a simple, simple, simple system. In fact, it's just, this is 10% of the 50 week closing high, which is the closing high would be right there. I know everybody's eyes are glazing over, but to those new to my YouTube channel or my website, it's 50 week closing high, less 10%. And then the 50 week moving average is down here. This is a weekly chart. And it's it, my intent was to design a longer term trend following system. And by accident, I didn't realize it would actually get, a, get you out of the market as quick as it does when the market begins to come unglued a little bit. Now, it did have a subsequent buy and the market made this V-shaped recovery. And that's one thing that I did learn with the system is if you have a more gradual type of recovery or bottoming process like 2007 2008 and then what was the other bottom 2002 2003 then the the buy line or the 10 percent line does catch up with price and that worked out kind of nicely recently and we'll get to that in just one second so technically that was a whipsaw because it got you out here then it got you back in here okay so you might say, well, that's what good is that? Well, what good is that is 
you were able to sleep at night. And I remember after this, and I, and I know you people here are probably tired of me saying this, but I remember after that signal triggered and I got out of the market, being, mostly getting out of the market for me means uh, hitting stops on my initial positions and then possibly looking to short some stuff. But I definitely don't want to be long indices when I have a sell signal, which such a major sell signal like this, or something like a weekly bow tie or something like that. And even daily bow ties off of all time highs or something that you might want to pay attention to. But anyway, long story endless, as I said before, I remember a friend of mine was visiting as this thing continued to implode. And he was literally like white in the morning when he saw how much stocks had dropped again overnight. So there's there's a sleeping factor that comes in when you're timing the market or using market timing. And, and a lot of people say it cannot be timed. Well, you could certainly miss some really ugly times in the market. Now, if the market just goes straight up for five years, you would be much better off just being long. And a system like this would get you long and you would pretty much be long. But let's say during that five year period, you had a couple of spills, then longer term, it looks like, well, why bother getting out? Well, why bother getting out is to avoid those occasional diaper change moments. And again, that was the designer's intent, borrowing a line from Ian McActivy. Now, he's like, he was saying, why take, why take the latest buy signal? Well, look what the last buy signal did. The market went up 66%. Now, you could argue, well, it was a little late to get back in the market. And it was because you had a V-shaped recovery, but there were other things around that time that began to trigger and began to, it, when the market began to improve, especially like on a daily chart, there's daily bow ties on things of that nature. But you could see 66% until this sell signal here, which gets you out of the market. And then the market dropped 27%. Okay, so that should get you pretty excited. I'm not trying to sell you in the system because I'll give it to you, <laughs> but you can see. It kept, it kept you out of the market for nearly all of 2022 and almost half of 2023, or a few months, I should say, at least four months of 2023. So that's a long time, a year and change to be out of the market. And it's a pretty good time to be out of the market. And I don't want to back into this too much, but a lot of the buy and hope type of people will tell you, well, if you missed the if you miss the 10 greatest days, then your performance isn't that good. So you have to be in the market all the time. It's like, well, what if you miss the 10 worst days? And a lot of that type of apologetic analysis comes from Greg Morris. And if you look uh, look at his book, Investing with the Trend, he turns a lot of that stuff on its head. You can go to davelander.com slash books dash two dash read for more on that. Uh, the, the books to read, that is. But anyway, uh, most of your ugly days happen when the when you have some sort of momentum momentum signal to the downside, such as it violating the 10% line and also closing below that 50-week moving average. Uh, in 1987, you had a crash. Soon after it did that, in 1929, you had a crash. Soon after it did that, the market doesn't always crash, though. Sometimes you will get a false signal. And sometimes you get a whipsaw and that could be a little frustrating if you're following a system. But where you, you can take solace is in the fact that when you're down 27 percent from the exit, you can sleep like a baby while everybody else is getting a little bit panicky. Anyway, there's a subsequent buy signal up about six percent from there. When I did this screenshot, I think we closed a little bit higher. But I was up about 20 points from the buy signal that I, I took on this. So just 100 shares. But, you know, here's the thing. This is a testament for longer term trading. And I know it's too early to start kissing each other just yet on this signal. But $2,000 is nothing to sneeze at for sitting in an ETF for a couple of months. Anyway, I'm a nerd, but I think all this stuff is pretty cool. So uh, as far as designer's intent, it's acting like it should, and I think it's acting good. What I would encourage this gentleman to do is look at all signals versus just cherry picking one. And 
even if you just look back to the last buy signal and the last sell signal, he should have been pretty impressed. And then the sell signal before that, again, with the pandemic, with a 20% slide, that's that's a big haircut. I mean, let's say you got a million dollars in stocks, that's $200,000, okay? And let's say that's all you have and you're retired and you you're, you still want that growth in stocks, so you got a million dollars and all of a sudden you're out $200,000. It's gonna take you a long time to recover that. And what's the, um, if you draw down 20%, what's it take to get back to break even? Let's say you go down 20%, 100, let's say 80 times, if you make back 20%, now you're gonna make back like 25% or 30%, and then it goes geometric from there. Anyway, so be careful just looking at uh, one or two signals versus cherry picking one. And as I often preach, and I'll, I'll say it a couple more times tonight, you wanna play devil's advocate when you're looking at any system. So this guy is, is doing the right thing by questioning it, but he needs to go in and look at every single signal. Ask yourself, is the system performing to the designer's intent? Again, borrowing a line from Ian McActivy, the, the idea was to have a system to help you avoid diaper change moments. A diaper change moment in the NASDAQ in the in the 19, in the 2000 actually would have been a 77% slide. In the Great Depression, it would have been an 80 or 90% slide. So you wanna be out of the market when these really bad things happen. And that's the designer's intent so to speak, although it does show merit on the long side too. So make sure you know the designer's intent if you're looking at somebody's stuff. And hopefully I do a good job of doing that. So the question is, what's your process? Well, I'll look at charts. I look at lots and lots and lots of charts. And as I often say, study the genuine article. Every night when I'm going through my 2000 stocks, any stock that takes off, the first thing I do is I go in and, and look at it and say, okay, is there a pattern there where I could have caught the move? And I noticed that John, our resident IPO expert on the, on the in Facebook, does the same thing. When he sees one take off, he starts kind of noodling with it a little bit. And that's, that's how you do it. That's exactly how you do it, John, and others. But uh, find stocks that look really good. And, you know, study past, his past winners too. You can go to davelearn.com slash archives and go through those stocks there if you have the time and look at, these are all the service stocks I recommended over the last 20 years or so. Go in and look at those and see which ones really worked out well and see what common characteristics they have. And then, you know, maybe look at some stinkers too and play devil's advocate and say, well, could, should he have taken this setup to begin with? There's lots of noodling and what ifs, and like I'll notice just something simple like, and I hate to use the word candles, but I guess I'll use it. <laughs> but the real bodies of candles sometimes stack up. So I think there's something there. I've been calling it stackers, and I've been, been kind of noodling with that a little bit. I haven't come up with anything, but it is kind of a cool thing when you get this little stack happening. So that's just something I noticed probably over the last year or whatever. The more you look at charts, the more you're you're going to start to see these reoccurring patterns. So what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for conceptually correct ways to catch big moves. For instance, a buy at B in the IPOs. Conceptually correct just means that there's some sort of basis for why you are trading a certain way. So if, it, if you're trend trading, then you know that there is demand for the market and you have some sort of setup to get you in, maybe after correction, such as a pullback, when that trend begins to resume. So the idea is that you're gonna become part of that demand and hopefully that demand continues to come in to the market. So, for, and you're along for the ride, that's just trend following. And for a conceptually way to correct, to catch a move in IPOs, I was thinking, well, an IPO is a brand new stock. If it starts making new highs, then maybe it's in pretty good shape because Let's say it's going to 100. Well, it's going to have to pass through 10 first if 10 is a brand new high. And then I started studying the closing highs because that's something I learned many years ago. Sometimes a closing high can be kind of stealthy and be hidden below the real highs, and you can get a big move out of that. 
also look for maybe ways to stay out of trouble. It's like once again, you're kind of looking at the the flip side of things, and that's how I came up with the TFN 10% system. If a market's going to drop 50% in value, it's going to drop 10% first. Okay. Now 10% might be too big of a too small of a number, I should say, for a very volatile stock, and that's where you kind of need to eyeball it and maybe look at the historical volatility or HV as I call it to see if see how volatile stock is now as I'm doing research empirical research especially my thinking for instance with like the intraday trading is let's say I'm looking at SoxL and SoxL has this huge wide range bar well that that wide range bar will start with a narrow range bar that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And especially something like the S&P 500, although it works on all ETFs, but for the S&P 500, I'm very cognizant of, unless it's like an opening gap reversal situation or something, I'm very cognizant to let the market open and establish a range first to see how big that range is gonna be. And ideally, I wanna trade ranges that are 50% or more because those have the potential to go 100% or more for the day as far as the range expansion is concerned. Now, if they're at 29 or 39% or whatever, and all of a sudden it looks like they're making a really big move and it looks like I'm gonna get to that 50%, then maybe I might get in a little early, especially if it's an opening gap reversal again or something like that. And as I alluded to a second ago, something like the 10% line for indices is a good area to consider exiting a market to get out of trouble. How do you collect data? I've only seen a data file on the TFM 10% system. Do you have any other files you could share that show what data you collect for analysis? How do you run your back testing? So I talked about this last week. Let me just recap real quick, just to make sure every part of the question is answered. I back test by hand, bar by bar. I'll back up a chart. Yeah, Something like the S&P 500, I'll go back to the 1900s and then click, 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 click. Is that a signal? Is that a signal? Is that a signal? Yes, yes, no, no. And just one day at a time. And you learn a lot in the process by doing that. You'll learn about Landry Light. You'll learn about how that 10% line interacts. And in the case of like the 10, TFM 10% system, I started off with just a 10% line. And then I realized that there were some whipsaw times where excessive whipsaw where it would drop below 10% and pop right below, right right above, I'm sorry. And so what I decided to do is like, well, let me just figure out a simple whipsaw filter. And that's where the 50 simple moving average came in. Because sometimes that moving average will be a little bit below that 10% line and it'll violate the 10% line, but it won't violate the moving average. So that'll keep you in the market. And then on the upside, because I want to get out the market quickly, right? So a close below the 50 simple weekly and a close below the buy line gets me out of the market. But to get me back in, it has to close above the buy line and I need two bars greater than the 50 simple. That's the whole system right there. Okay, write that down. And that's just two bars of land your life to the upside. Now I have plenty of videos on the TFM system out there. Also, I think, I'm trying to think of a good link to give you. I'll put something in post maybe, but you can get a, uh, you can sign up on my website for a free membership and you'll get a free market timing course out of that, which has a TFM 10% system in it. And like I said last week, I'm not a mechanical, I'm not a mechanical trader, but in more recent years, I've incorporated some mechanical trading into my longer term analysis. So like I just said, I'm long the queues on a TFM 10% system and I don't, I need to be careful because like, I don't want to get start crazy day trading or whatever with my daughter's accounts but i figure it's safe to save quote unquote safe <laughs> but it's a, a little bit safer probably to just keep them in longer term because they are younger obviously and then use something like the tfm temper system to get them out of the market and i think it keeps you out the market about 30 percent of the time if memory serves and all that data was done by hand now, I used to do a shit ton of programming, as I've said before. How do you confirm the robustness of the results? Well, first thing is, is it accomplishing 
the designer's intent. Missing a 90% diaper change moment and something like the S&P 500 in the 30s and then missing the, or avoiding the 1987 crash, getting out of the market right when the pandemic began to hit hard, on the market at least, the market took it seriously, that's accomplishing my designer's intent. Intent. Now, can you actually trade it? That's that's one thing you need to think about. There's some stuff out there that might work, but it would be very hard to follow. The biggest question you probably need to ask is, does it win big and lose small? And can you put a little money management on top of it to make sure it does that too? Does it avoid some, but obviously not all, whipsaw? If you start working really hard with a lot of whipsaw filters, sooner or later you're going to curve fit the pass data perfectly. And I remember years ago I told someone who was a mechanical guy that his biggest drawdown was in front of him with the mechanical system, and he got very angry at me. And I would love to contact him today and ask him if I was right. But I don't want to be shot in Friday because I'm pretty sure I was right. Anyway, uh, as I've said quite often, statistics are worthless. 75.3% of all people know that. Feel free to play with the MFE and MAE and all the other good stuff. I think it's MFE is maximum favorable excursion and MAE is maximum adverse excursion. And I'm hoping I'm getting that right. I don't use that stuff anymore. Like I said last week, the problem with something like MFE is like, oh, you never really make more than than $2,000 with this system. So as soon as you get to $2,000, shut it down. Well, what happens if, first of all, you're capping your gains, and then what happens if the market really blows off, and then you might have a 1,000% gain, gain, okay? And then you, the other statistic is, well, what's the worst hit you take, and then it bounces back? There's some merit to that, but as a general statement, the statistics don't really do you any good because there's no guarantee that that's going to be the worst hit you ever take you know so you got to be careful now with statistics of course and the thing too to remember that markets don't adhere to statistics it's not norm they're not normally distributed they have fat tails and years ago i was talking with a cta back when i was a cta and he said, we're trading for that outlier. We're trading for that fat tail. And that's exactly what we're doing. Do you dissect the trade methodology idea against capitalization size, small, mid, large, and historic volatility thresholds, volume thresholds? If so, do you break stocks down into groups, small cap, large cap? Well, the quick answer to that is no, I do not. Now, as I'm kind of thinking about this, I, I have noticed things that might actually, for instance, the, the ogre is kind of just the opposite of what I look for, as I often say, in the in the the normal stocks, the, the average stocks I trade or the normal stocks I'm usually trading. So over the gap reversal, mm -hmm. you probably want like a a big cap stock. Like if the video would have gap down today and then started recovering because it's in a pretty good trend. That might have been a, an excellent opening gap reversal type of trade, a big, fat stick, thick stock. So, yes, as far as the observations are concerned from all my empirical research, which is a fancy word from looking at charts, but no as far as in general. Now, I do tend to notice tendencies, for instance, like volatile, volatile stocks within reason, offer your best chance of beating the market, okay? And I've done presentations before where I show how a volatile stock is actually less risky to trade than a less volatile stock as a general statement. And that's because a less volatile stock can't, something bad could still happen to that less volatile stock. Whereas the volatile stock, you sort of know the devil you're dealing with, and also, you're going to be trading a much smaller share size. You're already compensating for that crazy nature of that stock. Now, as a general statement, with the core methodology, smallish cap stocks tend to move better and more. But in more recent years, I have noticed some high volume speculative issues 
that could really take off. And this seemed to happen before the pandemic. And then it's like now you get these hot stocks that have millions and millions and millions of shares, and they're trading with a high volatility like a crazy, um, like something that would be like a crazy smaller cap stock. And, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here, you know, maybe that's some research to do, okay? Maybe take a look at super volatile stocks that have crazy volume. And, and that might be something worth looking into. I know on an intraday basis, volatile stocks that have big ranges and have super high volume can make for some interesting trades. And I've gotten caught, fortunately, on the right side, but it, it doesn't seem to work as good as it used to. But I've gotten caught in a few trading halts on some of these guys. And you always, in the old days, a trading halt meant the stock was going to open up huge afterwards. And But nowadays, it seems like they open down. So it's like it really, the trading halt actually seems to work to uh, calm people down a little. But yeah, that's another tendency is that volatile, highly volatile stocks with a lot of volume can offer some opportunities here and there. What's the process? Again, study, 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 and study the markets. Just look at charts. Lots of charts. Notice certain nuances that happen. Study the genuine article. Find some stocks that have done really well. Usually I'll showcase what's really working. And these weekend charts, occasionally I'll show a loser just to show that you can lose money trading and you have to honor your stop. But for the most part, you want to be focusing on the genuine article. And that line of reasoning comes from somebody emailed me years ago about counterfeit currency detectives. And as I've said quite often, they don't sit around and study a bunch of monopoly money. Yeah, this orange $500 bill is is bogus or this yellow you know, one, one third size hundred dollar bill is bogus they actually look at a real hundred dollar bill and they look for the look the feel the threads the little markers or whatever and whatever else they're looking for and the thing about the the currency detectives is that after studying and studying and studying the the intricacies of the currency a fake tends to stand out like a sore thumb. It looks, feels, it just immediately, they, they know like that, if it's fake or not. And, and your same sort of reasoning and logic works really, really well with stocks. Now, as I've said quite, quite a bit, keep in mind that years of mechanical system programming has made me a discretionary trader. Now, as I'll say in a minute, and I'll just repeat right now, I will bits and pieces, maybe follow something mechanical here and there. Like, for instance, I went long Qs just for S and Gs, only 100 shares. And I'm going to hang on to that until I get stopped out vis-a-vis -vis this system. And then I'll say, hey, well, we had a losing trade. Or, hey, look how easy it was. I just held on for five years, and it went up 200 points. Who knows? We'll just see what happens. Also, like I said last week, Emilio Tomasini, who I'll mention here again in one minute, he thinks I'm more mechanical than I really am, and I think he's more discretionary than he really is. Emilio Tomasini is known for mechanical systems. What am I looking for? I'm looking for an edge, not a grail. Grail hunting is fun, but it does not exist. I'm fairly convinced I would have found it after spending thousands and thousands of hours working on this. And I forget how many charts I've looked at over my career, but it's probably about 20 million by now. I mean, you figure a couple thousand a day over a year's time. What's that? Let's say, let's say 2,000 round numbers. Not counting a lot of the analysis. That's just the end of day analysis. 252. Yeah, it's a half a million a year. So 20 something years. So it's over 10 million at least. Now, over time, through again a shit ton of empirical research, I have noticed some things like Landry Light and bow ties. And so I'm not I'm not looking per se, okay? But sometimes it just finds me, like the real body stacking up, watching the intraday data, that might be something there, for instance. I don't know, I haven't fleshed it out yet. And the percent ranges and stuff like that, it just seems to make sense. It has to be something easy to recognize and again, follow it. Can you actually follow it? How do you discover, build, create rules for each trading setup? So again, look at a bunch of charts 
and see what's conceptually correct and plausible. And so the IPO example, again, makes a good a good example. We talked about it last week. It's like, okay, if an IPO, again, it's going to go from 10 to 100, it's going to have to make a new closing high first. Let's say it's at, it's at 7, okay, and 10 would be a new closing high. And I noticed that a lot of times the first week, they just kind of die out and never come back. So that taught me to wait until at least Friday. If it comes public on Monday, wait till the fifth day. So that's one thing. And I also noticed that if it was very, very thin, it might make that new closing high, but then implode because there's not enough players. And one big player comes in and unloads his shares and it can make the IPO crash. I noticed it worked a little bit better with $5 or higher IPOs. And I noticed that it worked better with $20 or less IPOs. So that's kind of like the sweet spot in there. And I'm not rigid in all this. And this is why if you're a pure mechanical trader, I, I think you can get into trouble because sometimes you have to be a little bit flexible. Now, if you're a mechanical trader and get flexible before you know it, you got to be careful because your discipline can go out the window. So everything I do is kind of gradual and slow. For instance, and not and not going to make a huge change in the in the basis of what I'm doing. So for instance, with the with the buy at B, I had a twenty dollar rule, but it seems like in more recent years, between twenty and thirty is okay. So now it's kind of more the thirty dollar rule. But with something like the TFM ten percent system. I'm not going to change that. I might noodle with a similar system, but I'm not going to change a TFM 10% system because once you get a mechanical system like that, you probably want to leave it in place. Now, am I talking out of both sides of my mouth? Maybe. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> but as long as something, if you got it all ironed out and it's pretty simple, then just follow the simple system. That's my whole goal a lot of times when I do any mechanical testing and research. And that's how it all got started back in 90, I always forget, I think it was 96 it actually came out. But but again, in 94, 95, when I was working on it, the like the 220 EMA system was just as simple as can be. I wanted to show that a simple system could work when it comes to trend following. Now, as an example for like rules and such, it's like something like a textbook TKO. That's where you have a TKO with a big wide range bar down. Sometimes you can enter just above the high and put a stop in just below the low. And then if you take that measurement of entry minus a stop, that gives you the initial profit target, the IPT. And by the way, I do have a spreadsheet that if you go to members resources on my website, I have a spreadsheet where you can punch in. If you punch in the entry and the stop, it'll calculate the number of shares based on your account size, based on the risk you want to put up. And it'll also calculate that IPT for you. And that's the beauty of like a textbook TKO. Everything is kind of already laid out for you. Can you recommend any references on how to research and analyze your trading ideas? So again, not to beat the dead horse, but just look at a lot of charts and see what's conceptually correct and plausible. And do a lot of hand walkthroughs bar by bar is a great thing to do. If you're just looking at setups for stocks in general, then just look at a lot of stocks again and study the success as opposed to trying to design a method. Obviously, something like market timing, you want to have something that's a little bit more mechanical and a little less feel. But as far as stocks, I use a lot of discretion in, and I think it's a look and a feel for the market. And I think that's how you want to approach it. And also, for instance, and this is what being a discretionary trade, I guess, is all about, too. We had a buy signal a while back in the S&P on the TFM 10% system, but it looked like the market had had completely reversed because it took off away from the moving average and came back in. And as I've said a thousand times, my moving average line was so wide that it actually touched the bar and I didn't see the daylight. And I didn't, or Landry light, I now call it. And I just didn't like the way it looked, and then I didn't realize it was the actual buy setup. But technically, if I was following the system mechanically, that would have been a buy. Years ago, I used to devour my stocks and commodity magazines, especially anything that related to system development. And 
as I've said quite a bit, years and years of programming have made me a discretionary trader. It very rarely do I go in and, and create something like TFM 10% system. But I do like to look at charts and then work on the art of reading the charts. But if you are really interested in system design, go back and get the back issues. I think you can probably get a CD or something and, and, and look at all those old stocks and commodities magazines. Emilio Tomasini, a friend of mine from Italy, he gave me a copy of his book in Italy when we were there in English, and it's called Trading Systems. I, I haven't found it since the move. I'd be happy to loan it out, but I don't know where it is. So that's the, that's the only book I can think of that gets into system design. So here's a slide from last week left over. So kind of everything I said tonight, empirical research is the best thing. And one thing that I think is kind of important here, two things actually. One, don't reinvent the wheel. It's it's It seems like my educational business, I work myself out of a job. And that can be kind of frustrating, just kind of me venting a little bit. It's like I work with somebody and I'll help them out, I'll help them out, I'll help them out. And then all of a sudden, they're like, oh, I got it. I'm going to go off my own now. And it's like, well, hang on, keep me on staff. You know, it's like, I wish I had somebody on staff, so to speak, that I could talk to about all these things and stuff that I'm getting into and working on. So it's kind of just the opposite of what the institutions would do. If the institutions are happy with you, they keep you around. But it's like the, the retail, nothing wrong with retail, we ought to stall somewhere. But the retail business, as soon as they begin to catch on a little bit, they quit. And, and a lot of these people, and I don't want to single anybody out, a lot of these people who think they got it, I, they're still making a lot of mistakes that I'm seeing. And so, you know, God bless them, but don't go out and reinvent the wheel is what I'm trying to say. It's like they, they get some ideas and then all of a sudden they, they try to do all these other crazy things and that just slowed down their learning. I know I'm talking about three different things at once, but that just slowed down their learning by possibly years or possibly forever. It's like, as I've said before, I spent 30 years working on the pullback. Take my stuff, okay? If you wanna tweak it up a little bit, knock yourself out, but take my stuff and maybe make it a little better and then make it your own, but don't start from scratch and reinvent the wheel. And I don't know why, but everyone seems to have to go through that process. Okay, John Ross has the book. <laughs> okay, you sent me that book a while ago, along with some others. Yeah, so uh, I cleaned out my books and that that one was not supposed to go. Uh, but uh, hang on to it, John. So at least it's out there. No, 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 don't worry about that. Just hang on to it. Sorry about that, Emilio. Didn't mean to do that. All right. Any questions or anything? Yeah, don't worry about it. Any questions on that before we hop into crypto? I know I kind of beat the dead horse a little bit, reiterating some of these things, but I wanted to make sure. I hate when somebody asks a question and they don't answer it. So I wanted to make sure I actually gave an answer. All right. Let's hop into crypto. Uh, I almost put out a post in Facebook right before we went live. I bought this stock right before we went live or this crypto. And so far, so good, knock on wood. And it just took off from the moving average and it pulled back a little bit. And I thought it had a shot. And I have an IPT at 20% on this. Here's that C web. I've been long forever. We just talked about that one. Got long on the pullback right here. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. If there's any pairs you guys want me to look at, let me know. Bitcoin found a little support at its prior lows. I wouldn't hang my hat just on that, but I do, I am kind of a, a, a closet bull, I guess, longer term on Bitcoin. But yeah, right now you still have Landry lights on the downside. So right now it still looks like it's in trouble. It does have some overhead supply. What's cool about Bitcoin is, is it gets its selling. It has a selling, I should say, should say. And then it just comes roaring back. Somebody wants it and they're willing to wait for it to get cheaper. And when it begins to take off a little bit, it's like they all rush in to pile back in. For instance, like back here, you can see, it looks like it was gonna just fall out of bed and then it was straight back up. And that's what you wanna trade off of that system, so to speak, but it's kind of interesting. It collapses and then it comes back with a vengeance. Now, I wouldn't trade a system again just off of that. That'd be reversed to mean, I guess. 
but it is an observation that I've seen with with Bitcoin. I think I think longer term, and I don't want to confuse the issue with facts here, but I think longer term, I think a lot of people want to own it, but they just sit around and sit on their hands when it begins to dive, and then I think some some bottom picking comes in, and people who want to own a lot of it start buying a lot of it. All right. As I often say, uh, one thing I like to do is just sort these things by the percent change, just day over day, and then look for stuff like, like so I'm long that one. Then I was just thinking, well, that kind of looks interesting because it's kind of, it's coming off the lows. It pulled back a little bit. It looks like it was kind of taken off again. So it's still kind of like in breakout mode from low levels as opposed to waiting for a, a, a nice pullback like in the C-Web. But anyway, I just for crypto, I just look at a lot of charts, just like everything else. And as I've been saying lately, a lot of the patterns look the same. Now this one might be a little thin; it's kind of taken off. Maybe on a pullback, let's see what that one does. And as I preach each week, if it's below the 50, I'm sorry, the 30 EMA, then pass. Okay, you guys want to look at any pairs? There's not a whole lot happening. I've just been onesie and twosie in it a little bit. I'm long those two, C Web and whatever else that other one is. <laughs> you see, I just buy stuff that goes up and sell stuff that goes down. It's like uh, my wife used to get mad at me because somebody would ask me about trading and I'd get into all this how to trade and all this other stuff and her eyes would roll, glaze over, whatever. I actually wrote about this recently. I forget if I talked about it or not. And then one night we're at dinner, we had dinner and um, somebody said, what exactly do you do? And I said, I just buy stuff that goes up and sell stuff that goes down. And my wife is like, thank you. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> so, all right, let's jump into stocks. It's kind of fascinating in here. A really interesting day today. The P's are a bit of a bummer. They broke out and then they came right back into their range, which kind of sucks to put it mildly. We had an okay day today, but we obviously need to get out of this range and not look back for a while. We're right at these one-year highs. And I was feeling pretty good about them. And I think we do have a buy signal. Yeah, we had a buy signal a few weeks ago. If you check the, I guess I call it bull market updates now on my website. At the top of my website, daveleonard.com, there's a little menu item. Let's take a look at the dollar while we're here. The dollar's been on a tear as of late. Dollar up means commodities down because you can buy more of them because they're dollar denominated. Although the world is trying to fix that. And then when they do, we're going to have a bunch of problems. But let's not worry about that today. NASDAQ just took off. NASDAQ looked fantastic because it took off. It broke out of this base and broke out to brand new highs and it took off for a while and then it came back in. It was drifting for a while and then it had me nervous and then it broke out of that wedge and then pulled back. And then today, obviously, getting a pop on the video. Obviously, follow through will be key. If we come back in tomorrow and give up this NVIDIA rally, I would be bummed out. Rusty just can't get off its ass to save its life. Multiple heads, multiple shoulders. That's what they call a complex head and shoulders bottom. No need to buy that. As I often preach, bigger picture technical analysis is great, but make sure you combine it with a setup, okay? It's hard to time off a big picture technical analysis. Yes, this is the mother of all bottoms. But so far, it's been a process, and it might continue to be a process for some time. Now, the dollar is probably not helping the energy as much. You can see they broke down a little today. They're looking kind of toppy. I've got a couple of energy shorts on my Landry list. I'm not too excited to rush out and short them, but they are there, and it's something that I'm beginning to think about a little bit. Take a look at the metals. The metals are getting spanked in here, and that's probably in part based on the dollar. And one reoccurring theme, especially tonight I'm seeing, is a lot of these sectors get gone and they're looking great and all of a sudden pff, they just come right back in. Foods, for instance, not that I'm going to chase foods, but you can see foods took off, off to the races and then 100% retrace of the breakout and then just continue to slide in here. Banks haven't come unglued too much since the debacle we had a while back, but I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy them at this juncture you probably of course want to keep the uh keep your eye on like uh the regionals which is uh krb it's in here somewhere kre i guess kre 
looks a little uglier in the banks themselves. I'd like to see them push this overhead supply. So yeah, downtrend still intact there. This is kind of a market where I hope it stops going down. I know it's a dangerous thing to do. Gold, the commodity, not getting much help from the dollar probably, but gold's been in a breakdown. I'm not very excited about gold. There were some people on the panel, I think it was um, Joe Rabble was uh, kind of excited about gold. It, this is supposed to be a bow tie, but something happened to my charts. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, the, it, it has bow tie down. Imagine that other bow tie in there. What's it missing? A 30? Let's put a 30 in there. So, yeah, it looks like a bow tied uh, as of today. So, technically, on a bounce, it would be a short. So, I'm not too excited about gold at this juncture. Let's take a look at silver. Same sort of action. Silver is also bow tied to the downside. So, in downtrend, proper order. So this looks like a market that's in trouble. And if the dollar stays strong, that's gonna to continue to put some pressure on the commodities. If you guys wanna start asking about individual issues, feel feel free to do so now. I know we talk about stocks all day in Facebook and we're probably caught up. Okay, drugs, another example of a market that was doing pretty good and now it's beginning to break down again. Even with today's, thank you, Brian, keep them coming. Even with today's action, you can see that biotech, well, this is drugs, but biotech, similar um, similar breakdown today, not doing so hot. So that's a bit of a bummer. It's like the drugs are gonna lead us out. No, they're not. Foods, no, they're not. You know, it's like, they just keep getting thwarted. You can see biotech right here at these one year highs or whatever that was, okay, doing pretty good. And then <clears throat> came right back in. Not the end of the world, but obviously you wanna see these things pop higher. Take a look at health services. Another market trying to take off. Nope, came right back in. Defense beginning to break down a little bit from high levels. That's kind of interesting. MNC, one of my more favorite areas at the moment. You can see nice trend. We did this little gap here. That's not the end of the world. So far, just pulling back. One of the few areas that is, that's in a decent uptrend for now. Take a look at software. Software had a nice pop today right here at these multi-month highs. So that's a good thing. I would hate to have it come right back in, but that's pretty good looking market, as you can see. Higher highs and higher lows. Take a look at the semis. Now the semis were another one of those bit of a bummer. They broke out and then came right back in and then bam, today they broke out with a vengeance. Let's hope that, I know I just said hope, I'm saying hope a lot tonight, right? And the reason I'm saying hope is it's a mixed market. So I'd like to see some follow through. But you can see, nice day, let's, let's, here it comes again, hope, let's hope they can string a few good days together. All right, let's take a look at some of your stock picks and then we'll, we'll see what else we could find tonight. All right, CRVS, CRVS. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, volume is decent. It's got some crazy trading, but that looks like you've got enough trading in between. We're the okay. This is one that's on my momentum list. Decent volume, decent HV. It has not pulled back enough though. Just and, and just by eyeballing, I could say, okay, it's got HV of 147. It's gone from one dollar to what's that, three or four hundred percent run in here. So it needs a little bit more knockout. But good eye on that one, Brian. AKBA, AKBA. Yeah, this one's okay. Um, unfortunately, it's it's pulled back to where it broke out from. And then longer term, it's got a lot of issues. And markets have long memories. People that got spanked back here, a lot of them are probably still hanging on to this thing, hoping and wishing they'll come back. And again, even if I didn't have that part of the chart, it did break out, but it came back in from where it broke out from. So I would pass on that one for sure. GRBK. Okay, let's check uh, decent volume. Uh, it's kind of funky looking at the moment. It needs a little bit more pullback. One thing I hate is when the trend is just a couple of wide range bars. I wouldn't completely rule it out, okay? Because it is in home builders, which is interested. And it did accelerate higher, but I'd prefer if it was a more, kind of like that SIM did when it accelerated. Let's take a look at that real quick. So notice that accelerated higher. You had a few bars straight up here, which is a little bit concerning. 
because I like to see more than just a few, but then it consolidated and then it took off. And then now you've got a pretty decent trend here that's an accelerating trend higher. Whereas this is just a few bars in here. So I wouldn't completely rule it out, but maybe in a little bit deeper pullback, let's come back to that one and reevaluate it. VYGR. Yeah, this is something that probably needs to be on your momentum list. It's got some issues. Longer term, I prefer if it didn't have all this trading over here, but that has been a while ago. It needs a little bit more pullback, but if it pulls back much further, then you're back below this prior little breakout area. It's okay, okay? It's not fantastic, but it's okay. Um, okay, volume, okay, HV. And, and this is another of those cases where most of your trend is just this one huge bar here. I like to see, again, a trend develop over a period of time, like with that SY. Yeah, but it's okay. Let's see what happens when it pulls back a little bit further. So it needs a little more pullback. Probably end up passing on that one. In Inox, uh, I do like some of these. It's something I was talking about in the pitch yesterday. And you've got a lot of overhead supply. I realized that's a long time ago. But markets do and can have long memory. So that's one thing that's kind of jumping out at me. One thing I do like, though, is a lot of these medical devices and biotechs and health service stocks, or especially super speculative ones like this, or bottoming out and beginning to have these serious rallies off their lows, it could set up really, really soon. So check the land list for a couple of those if you want to be super speculative and go after. All right, any more you guys want me to look at? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, you could shoot me an email. Please leave a comment below if you have some questions. I do read all the comments and some of tonight's show obviously came from those comments from uh, my other presentation I did last week or whenever it was. So feel free to leave a comment, like, subscribe, and all that other good stuff if you're getting something out of it. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. <laughs> all right, everybody have a great extended weekend. Uh, if you're not in Facebook, I'll be checking in throughout the weekend. So feel free to hit me up there if uh, you need any help with anything or just want to talk the markets. Everybody have a great night again. Uh, happy Memorial Day weekend. And see you next week. No, actually, next week, I'm probably not going to do a show due to the holiday. Anyway, uh, I think that's enough wrap up. Uh, <laughs> Hey, again, enjoy your weekend, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You guys are welcome.